Good evening, everyone. I'm seeing the numbers uh, ratchet up. Good evening. Over 100 already. So good evening, everyone. Uh, um, just to say I'm, we're all used to it, but uh, please make sure you're on mute. Um, I am Professor Ian Gadd. I am uh, the chair of the board of directors of the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. And I'd like to welcome you all to our annual Victor Suchar Christmas lecture. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to welcome the Deputy Mayor of Bath, Councillor Dr. Yushtikwa uh, Kumar, who is joining us tonight and who has generously agreed to speak at the conclusion of tonight's event. Our Christmas lectures began in, were begun by Victor Suchar back in 1998, and following his death in 2007, they were renamed in his honour. Their purpose has been to invite the very best of speakers from across the academic disciplines to explore a key question or a key issue. Speakers have included the mathematical physicist, Sir Michael Berry, the philosopher, John Gray, the uh, geneticist, Steve Jones, the Shakespearean, Jonathan Bate, the polymer scientist, Julia Higgins, and the biographer, Hermione Lee. Okay. Our, our speaker tonight is Professor Martin Rees, Baron Rees of Ludlow. He is not only the Astronomer Royal, not only Professor Emeritus of Cosmology and Astrophysicist, Astrophysics at the University of Cambridge, not only the former Master of Trinity College Cambridge, Fellow and former President of the Royal Society, not only Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Academy of Medical Sciences, the Royal Astronomical Society and an Honorary Fellow of the Institute of Physics, not only a member of the Order of Merit and not only a member of the House of Lords, but he is also the first returning speaker for our Christmas lecture, having spoken at Queen's Square exactly 20 years ago this month. His subject then was the beginning and the end of the universe. And although I am no scientist myself, I think I can safely say that we are now further away from the former and a good deal closer to the latter than was the case back in 2001. On behalf of the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution, I'm delighted to welcome Lord Rees back to Bath, although for obvious reasons we are having to host him virtually. I also want to thank Andreas Vassmer, Chair of our Programme Subcommittee, for managing all the Zoom technicalities uh, tonight. As I have now come to the end of my beginning, I would like to now pass right, over to Professor Stuart Reynolds, like who is the current right, convener right, of the Victor Suchar Christmas Lecture and who will formally introduce the lecture. Stuart. Good evening. I'm really privileged to be able to introduce uh, one of the UK's most prominent scientists and public intellectuals, Martin Rees, Lord Rees, the Astronomer Royal. Uh, you've already heard from Bath Royal Chair Ian Gadd something about Lord Rees's many distinctions. He's an internationally known scientific figure and we're really honoured that he was able to accept our invitation. Uh, I'm a scientist and to me it's actually really important to mention that Lord Rees is not only distinguished in the UK's public domain of policy and public comment, but really he's an extremely distinguished scientist, uh, a famous figure in the international community of science. His career in theoretical physics, astronomy and cosmology has largely concerned the origin and evolution of the universe and its large scale structure. And it's played an important role uh, in the development of our present understanding of the nature of the cosmos. He's not only won many honours and prizes for that work, but he's also derived the ineffable satisfaction that all scientists <laughs> crave of knowing that he's contributed to the progress of fundamental understanding. As Ian mentioned, this isn't actually the first occasion that Martin Rees has accepted our invitation to lecture at Bath. Um, we were very much aware that Martin's previous lecture was the best attended and one of the most well-received Christmas lectures ever. And so, of course, we thought it'd be very nice if he could do it again. But we were also aware that in the intervening years, uh, Lord Rees has developed a new interest. 
And this new interest is what I can only describe as a meditation informed by scientific understanding on the present condition and future prospects of the human species. As Martin will observe in his lecture, today the Earth's physical systems and its flows of energies and materials are dominated by humans. We scarcely realize our power. We hardly recognize the responsibility to use that power wisely or the risks that our way of life may come apart at the seams. And to facilitate the necessary hard hitting thinking on such matters, Lord Rees has co founded the Centre for Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge. And uh, tonight he's going to peer into the future scope on our behalf and tell us what he's seen there. I would contend that this is a perfect subject for a Christmas lecture. While in many ways Christmas is a comfortable and reassuring festival, it's also true that at this time of year, we're bound to think about both the successes and failures of the past year, and also uh, what the next one will bring. It's dark outside and such thoughts aren't always comfortable. That master storyteller and discerning student of human emotions, Charles Dickens, was well aware of this when he wrote A Christmas Carol in 1843. Just think about Scrooge's feelings as he prepares to meet the ghosts of Christmas past, Christmas present and future. Was there a moral in the story of Scrooge? Of course there was. Dickens was telling us that it's never too late to address the problem when we discover our way of life has gone wrong. Christmas can offer us some relief from the pressures of the present, but it's also a very good time to examine how we shape up to the responsibilities of the future. So uh, I'm kind of hoping that Martin Rees will be able to tell us that perhaps the human species can mend its ways. And at this point, I'll just mention that Lord Rees uh, has written an excellent book uh, about all this. Here it is. It's called On the Future and it's published by Princeton University Press. And if you find Martin's lecture interesting, then you can dig down much deeper by reading the book. Perfect Christmas reading, or perhaps even to put into a thoughtless relative's stocking. Oh, gosh, did I say that? Um, the book's available at £9.99 or less from all good bookshops, like Mr B's and Waterstones here in Bath, and also, of course, from lots of online booksellers like Blackwell's. And uh, I'll put up details of the book in the chat. Anyway, uh, I'll just remind you now of Zoom etiquette for the evening. First of all, would you please all check now to ensure that your camera's switched off and that your microphone is muted? That's everybody except uh, Lord Reese, of course. The icons that allow you to do this are in most cases located at the left of the bar on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Please be sure to do this. There are so many people present, present in this Zoom call that turning off your camera and mic will avoid accidental intrusions into public space. And importantly, it will also preserve bandwidth so that everyone can enjoy the best possible sound quality and image quality during the talk. Second. Lord Rees has indicated that he's keen to answer questions, but we'll have them at the end and not before, please. And this is how we'll do it. If you wish to ask a question, select the chat button on the bar at the bottom of the screen and a chat sidebar will open up at the side of the screen. So if you think of a question as we go along, please type it into that chat feature. Be careful not to hit uh, the return until you've finished everything you want to put in the box. Be very brief and focus on the main point, please. At the end of the lecture, I'll put your chat questions to Lord Rees on your behalf. I'm going to do this because it'll be much quicker if I do that that way. And uh, actually, with so many people here, I'm anticipating there are going to be a lot of questions. In fact, if there are too many uh, questions. I and others behind the scenes may need to select the most pertinent of them. But if it's possible, I do promise that we'll try to cover them all. Third, I'll just point out that you'll get the best screen experience from the talk if uh, you go to the view uh, button, uh, which in most cases you'll see at the top right hand of the band on the top of the Zoom screen. And there you should select the speaker 
option from the list under that view button. And that will give you uh, the best view of Lord Rees as and his slides as he talks to us. And so now uh, I'll ask Lord Rees to speak about the world in 2050 and beyond. Over to you, Martin. Yes. OK. Well, Stuart, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a great pleasure. And it doesn't seem 20 years since I was with you before. As I have said then, uh, because I have the title Astronomer Royal, I'm often asked, do you do the Queen's horoscopes? But I have to say that I'm just an astronomer, not an astrologer. I've got no crystal ball. And scientists are really rotten forecasters, almost as bad as economists. But I have nonetheless, as you mentioned, uh, written a book called On the Future. And it's actually now out in, in a paperback, which is updated with a chapter on COVID. And the theme of the book is this. It's that this century is special. The Earth's been around for 45 million centuries, but this is the first when one species, the human species, has the planet's future in its hands. We're deep in what's called the Anthropocene. But let me first focus on two things where we can predict even with a cloudy crystal ball. First, the world in 2050 will be more crowded. 50 years ago, world population was below 4 billion. It's now about 7.8 billion. The growth has been mainly in Asia and Africa. And this distorted map from Danny Dawling at Oxford gives each country an area proportional to the population growth in the last 30 years. The number of births per year worldwide actually peaked a few years ago and is going down in most countries. Nonetheless, world population is forecast to rise to about 9 billion by 2050. That's for two reasons. First, most people in the developing world are young and they have longer lifespans than their parents. And secondly, there are some areas like parts of India and Sub-Saharan Africa where the birth rate is still high. But what will change is the age distribution very much. On the left, we have the present age distribution in West Africa, where most people are young. And on the right, we have the distribution in Europe. And as you can see, even if the population remains steady, then if the young people at the bottom on the left were to live longer, then that would fill up and we'd have more people in the world, even if uh, the number of births was only at replacement level. Well, despite doom-laden forecasts in the 1960s, food production has kept pace with rising population. Famines still occur, but they're due to conflict or maldistribution, not to innovations, converting insects and maggots, highly nutritious and rich in proteins, into palatable food, and making artificial meat. To quote Gandhi, to be enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Projections beyond 2050 are very uncertain. Falling infant mortality, urbanization, and women's education trigger the demographic transition towards lower birth rates. But there could be countervailing cultural influences. For instance, if for whatever reason families in Africa remain large, then according to the UN, that continent's population could double again by 2100 to 4 billion, thereby raising the global population to 11 billion. Nigeria alone would then have as big a population, 900 million, as Europe and the US combined. Well, optimists say that each extra mouth brings two hands and a brain. But it's the geopolitical stresses that are most worrying. As compared to the fatalism of earlier generations, those in poor countries now know, by the internet, etc., what they're missing and migration is easier. 
So I think that wealthy nations, especially those in Europe, should urgently instigate a sort of mega Marshall Plan, a mega lend lease for Africa, and do this not just for altruistic reasons. And another thing, if humanity's collective impact on land and on climate pushes too hard, the resultant ecological shock could irreversibly impoverish our biosphere. Extinction rates are rising. We are destroying the book of life before we've read it. Already there's more biomass in chickens and turkeys than in all the world's wild birds. And the biomass in humans, cows and domestic animals is 20 times that in wild mammals. Biodiversity is crucial to human well-being. The richness of our biosphere has value in its own right, not just its value to us. And to quote the great Harvard ecologist, E.O. Wilson, mass extinction is a sin that future generations will least forgive us for. So the world's getting more crowded. And there's a second firm prediction. In contrast to population issues, climate change is certainly not under-discussed, although, as we all know, it's uh, under-responded to. This is a famous Keeling curve due to a father and son making observations from Hawaii of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And it shows that it's risen by at least 50% in the last half century. The oscillations, incidentally, occur because there are more trees in the northern hemisphere than the south. So in the northern autumn, when the leaves fall off the trees, the CO2 goes, goes up, and then it goes down again in the spring when that's sucked in again. So that's the oscillation, but more important is a superimposed overall rising gradient, which is what, of course, affects global warming. And the IPCC in its reports has presented a spread of projections. And here, here is one. Uh, this is uh, the projections of the temperature rise on different assumptions about the amount of fossil fuel production in the next decade. These, I won't go into the details, but I would emphasize the four bars on the right, which uh, indicate the uncertainty of each model, because it's important to emphasize that there are still some uncertainties in these models, uh, largely because we don't know how cloud cover will change if the climate of the world changes. And that makes a big difference, obviously. So the need for action uh, has been uh, emphasized as these models are getting more precise. And despite the uncertainties, there is one message which I think all the people who thought about climate would agree with. It's this. It's that under business as usual scenarios, where we go on burning fossil fuels, we can't rule out later this century really catastrophic warming and tipping points triggering long-term trends like the melting of Greenland's ice cap. Where politicians, of course, focus on immediate threats like COVID-19. But the trouble is they won't prioritize the global and long-term measures needed to deal with climate change and with biodiversity. That's because their worst impact stretches far beyond the time horizon of political and investment decisions, and far beyond the next election. So we're like the proverbial boiling frog, contented in a warming tank until it's too late to save itself. And of course, it's nations far away from ours which will suffer most from climate change. Some of you may have read the work of the Danish campaigner, Born Lomberg. He's got sort of bogeyman status among environmentalists, but that's a bit unfair because he doesn't contest the science. But his Copenhagen consensus of economists, a group of eminent economists, downplays the priority of addressing climate change compared to shorter term ways of helping the world's poor. So he doesn't support normal policies. But the reason for that is clear, is that he applies a standard discount rate to future benefits and future disbenefits. 
and that therefore writes off what happens much beyond 2050. But if you care about those who live to the end of a century, and most babies today, or to live well into the 22nd century, then as other economists like Stern and Weizmann have argued, then it is worth paying an insurance premium now to insure against the worst case of drastic temperature rise by the end of a century. Unsurprisingly, it's the young who expect to live to the end of a century, whose clamor for action is loudest. We saw this in Glasgow. Their leverage on voters and the media is amplified by charismatic individuals. Scientists alone aren't very charismatic, but I mentioned the disparate quartet of Pope Francis, David Attenborough, Bill Gates, and Greta Thornburg, all very different from each other, but together they've had a big effect on raising this issue, issue on the public agenda and making politicians take it more seriously. And of course, some of this happened at COP26 in Glasgow, but to be honest, what that did was kick the can down the road to the meeting next year in Egypt, where we hope that there will be some firmer pledges made. But to insert a bit of good cheer, I think there is a win-win roadmap to a low carbon future. And it's this, it's that nations should accelerate research and development into all forms of low carbon energy generation and into other technologies where we need parallel progress, especially storage, batteries, compressed air, pump storage, hydrogen, etc., and smart transcontinental grids to carry solar energy from the sunny south to the less sunny north. And if those were developed, then they would enable Europe and North America to reach net zero. But there's something even more important. The faster these clean technologies advance, the sooner will their prices fall so that they become affordable to the poor nations, the poor nations in the global south. Those nations can't reach successful living standards without generating more power per capita than they do today. And their populations are rising too. So bending the trajectory of CO2 emissions from those countries, be four billion in those countries, that is far more important uh, than anything we do with our own emissions. We must deal with our own emissions, but we must also do what we can to enable those countries to leapfrog more speedily to clean energy rather than building more coal-fired power stations. Let's hope they can do that just as they've leapfrogged to smartphones and never had landline. And it will be hard to think of a more inspiring challenge for young engineers than devising clean and economical energy systems which can achieve net zero, not just for us in the UK, but for the world. So we should be evangelists for new technology, not Luddite. Without it, the world can't provide food and sustainable energy for an expanding and more demanding population. Indeed, many of us are anxious that some technologies are advancing so fast that we may not properly cope with them and that we will have a bumpy ride through this century. And that's another theme in my book. Well, nuclear war still looms over us. And the only consolation is that there are about five times fewer weapons and are lower alert than the US and Russia deployed during the Cold War, which we were lucky to get through. But there are now nine nuclear powers and a higher chance than ever before that smaller nuclear arsenals might be used regionally or even by terrorists. And incidentally, some claim that the command and control systems of these weapons are getting more vulnerable to cyber threats. Moreover, we can't rule out later in the century a standoff between new superpowers, which could be handled less well or less luckily than, say, the Cuba crisis was. Nuclear weapons are based on 20th century science, but this century has brought surges 
in new technologies, bio, cyber, and AI in particular. So a word about each of these. Advances in microbiology, in diagnostics, in vaccines and antibiotics, they offer prospects of improving world health and containing natural pandemics. The same research raises, and this is my number one nightmare, the prospect of engineered pandemics. For instance, in 2012, groups in Wisconsin and in Holland showed that the influenza virus, shown here, could be surprisingly easily modified to make it more virulent and more transmissible. And to some, this was a scary portent for things to come. And these so-called gain-of-function experiments can be done in principle for coronaviruses too. And the new CRISPR-Cas9 technique for gene editing is hugely promising, but there are ethical concerns about experiments in human embryos in China, for instance. And there are also worries about possible runaway consequences of so-called gene drive. This involves a program to wipe out species by making them sterile. And it's been talked about for a kind of mosquito that carries a dangerous disease, which seems fine. But also some nasty people wanted to use it to wipe out the gray squirrel, which of course is parasitic compared to the, uh, the brown squirrel. But there are worries, of course, of runaway effects if we start tampering with the ecology in these ways. So regulation of biotech is needed. But I'd worry that whatever regulations are imposed on grounds of prudence or on ethics can't be enforced worldwide any more than the drug laws can or the tax laws. Whatever can be done will be done by someone somewhere. And that really is a nightmare. An atom bomb can't be built without large-scale special purpose facilities. The biotech involves small-scale dual-use equipment, readily available in many labs. And the rising empowerment of tech-savvy groups, or even individuals, by biotech, by cybertech as well, will pose an intractable challenge to governments. And it will aggravate the tension between three things we want to preserve, freedom, privacy, and security. The global village will have its village idiots, and their idiocies can now cascade globally. These concerns are fairly near term, within the next 10 or 15 years. But what about 2050 and beyond. On the bio front, you might expect two things. First, a better understanding of the combination of genes which determine key human characteristics and the ability to synthesize genomes that match these features. So, if this happens, designer, babel, designer babies may become conceivable in both senses of that word. But if biohackers can, as it were, play God on a kitchen table, our ecology and even our species may not long survive unscathed. So the long-term developments of biotech are scary too. And what about another transformative technology? Robotics and AI. DeepMind's AlphaGo Zero computer famously beat human champions in the game of go and chess. It was just given the rules and trained by playing millions of games against itself in just a few hours. But the human challenger in Go, here he is, Mr. Lo Kui, he has some advantages. The computer used hundreds of kilowatts of power. He uses in his brain about 30 watts, a light bulb. And he can do a lot of things <laughs> just play, playing a game. But of course, it's the speed of computers. And this graph shows how over the last decades, it's hugely increased owing to Moore's law, uh, does allow AI to cope better than humans with uh, data rich, fast changing networks. It can not only play games, but it can 
deal with, say, traffic flow or electric grids far better than a human. And indeed, the Chinese could have an efficient planned economy of a kind that Marx could only dream of and which the Soviets could never achieve because it can obtain and process data on the stock in every shop and every person's purchases. And incidentally, AI can help science with protein folding, drug developments, and perhaps even settle for physicists like me where the string theory can really describe our universe. But the implications of AI for our society are already ambivalent. And some of you may have heard uh, um, the brief lectures uh, this, this, uh, this month on just these topics. If we're sentenced to a term in prison, recommended for surgery, or even to a poor credit rating, we'd expect the reasons to be accessible to us and understandable by us. If these decisions were entirely delegated to some algorithm, we'd be entitled to feel uneasy, even if presented with compelling evidence that on average, the machines make better decisions than the human stage user. So we should worry that AI systems are becoming more intrusive and pervasive. Records of all our movements, our health, our financial transactions will be in the cloud, managed by a multinational quasi-monopoly. The data may be used for nine reasons, for instance, medical research, or to warn us of incipient health risks, but its availability to internet companies is already shifting the balance of power from governments to uh, globe-standing conglomerates. And AI will cause shifts in the nature of work. These have been addressed in several excellent books by economists and social scientists. Clearly, machines will take over much of manufacturing and retail distribution. They can supplement, if not replace, many white-collar jobs. Routine legal work, accountancy, computer coding, medical diagnostics, and even surgery. In contrast, some skilled service sector jobs, plumbing and gardening, for instance, require such non-routine interactions with the external world that they'll, I think, be among the hardest jobs to automate. The digital revolution will generate enormous wealth for innovators and these global companies. But preserving a healthy society will surely require redistribution of that wealth, the ability to tax these companies. And indeed, to create a humane society, I think governments will need to vastly enhance the number and status of those who care for the old the young and the sick. There are currently far too few of these, and they're poorly paid, inadequately esteemed, and insecure in their position. These jobs are far more fulfilling than jobs in call centers or Amazon warehouses that AI can reserve. So by redistributing wealth from these big companies to set up more jobs for carers and other roles where being a human is important, that can be a win-win situation. It is, as I mentioned, the speed of computers, which allows them to learn on big training sets. They learn to identify dogs, cats, and human faces by crunching through millions of images, not the way babies learn. They learn to translate by reading millions of pages of multilingual text. In Europe, they're given EU documents their boredom threshold is infinite. But acquiring common sense won't be so easy for these AI, because that involves watching real people in real homes or workplaces. And the machine will be sensorily deprived by the slowness of real life. For the machine, it's like watching the trees grow is for us. And robots are still clumsier than a child moving pieces on a real chessboard. They can't jump from tree to tree like a squirrel. So they've got a long way to go, but sensor technology is advancing very far. And this leads to a digression about innovation and the rate of progress in general. It's always harder to forecast the speed of technical changes than their direction. 
sometimes there's a spell of exponential progress, like I've seen in the computer speed on this slide, and like the spread of IT and smartphones in the last decade. But then there can be a sort of inflection followed by a kind of stagnation. Let me give two examples from earlier this century, last century. From Alcock and Brown's first transatlantic flights in 1919 to the first jumbo jet, Boeing 747, was 50 years. But 50 years later, you still have the jumbo jet. And Concorde came and went. No real change in the last 50 years, complete change in the previous 50 years. And let's take another example. It's only 12 years from Sputnik 1 in 1957 to the moon landings in 1969. But 50 years after that, the Apollo program is still the high point of human spaceflight. And experts are getting less optimistic about how quickly stage five fully driverless cars will become acceptable. And the iPhone 20, may not be too different from the present iPhone 13. So you can't predict the rate of progress, but let's nonetheless try to look still further ahead. What if a machine developed a mind of its own? Would it stay docile or would it go rogue? Futuristic books portray a dark side where AI gets out of its box, infiltrates the internet of things, pursues goals misaligned with human interest. Some AI pundits take this seriously, but others, like Rodney Brooks, inventor of the Baxter robot, regard these concerns as premature. He thinks it'll be a long time for artificial intelligence need worry us more than real stupidity does. But be that as it may, it's likely that society will be transformed by autonomous robots even though the jury's out of whether they'll be idiot savants or display superhuman capabilities. And whether, as I said, we should worry more about breakdowns and bugs or about being outsmarted. This is the visionary futurologist Ray Kurzweil, who works for Google. He argues in his book, The Aid to Spiritual Machines, that humans will transcend biology by merging their brains with computers. In old style spiritual parlance, they will go over to the other side. And we then incidentally confront the classic philosophical problem of personal identity. Could your brain be downloaded into a machine? If so, in what sense would it still be you? Should you be relaxed about your original body then being destroyed? What would happen if several clones were made of you? These are ancient conundrums for philosophers that practical ethicists may one distant day need to address. But Kurzweil is worried that his nirvana may not happen in his lifetime. So he wants to be preserved until it's reached. And there's a company in Arizona that will freeze and store your body so that when immortality is on offer, you could be resurrected or your brain downloaded. And I was surprised to find, incidentally, that three academics in England had gone in for this so-called cryonics. Two were paid the full whack, and the third has taken the cut price option of wanting just his head frozen. And I was glad that they were all from Oxford, and not from my university. Because I told them I'd rather end my days in an English churchyard than in an American refrigerator. But of course, research on aging is being seriously prioritized. Will its benefits be incremental or is aging a disease which as Kurzweil hopes can be as it were cured? Dramatic life extension would plainly be a real wild card in population projections with huge social ramifications. This may happen along with human enhancement in other forms. And incidentally, just recently, some American billionaires have set up labs, including one here in Cambridge, to focus on this aim. 
I guess is when they were young, these guys wanted to be rich. Now they're rich, they want to be young again. That may not prove quite so easy. But it's surely on the cards that human beings, their mentality and their physique, may become malleable through the de deployment, genetic modification, and cyber technologies. And we will indeed have to design a baby. Moreover, this future evolution, a kind of secular intelligent design, would take only centuries to evolve a new species, in contrast to the thousands of centuries needed for Darwinian evolution. And this is a game changer. When we admire the literature and artifacts which have survived from antiquity, we feel an affinity across a time gulf of two or three thousand years with these ancient artists and their civilizations. But we can have zero confidence that the dominant intelligence of a few centuries hence will have any emotional resonance with us, even though they may have an algorithmic understanding of how we behave. That's a rather scary prospect, I think. But now let me turn to another technology, space. It's beyond our Earth, in environments hostile to humans, that cyborg and AI technologies have the most spectacular scope, and where these changes, I think, would happen fastest, and where they should worry us least. During this century, the whole solar system will be explored by swarms of miniaturized probes, far more advanced than the wonderful Cassini probe. There it is. It was designed in the 1990s. It went as far as Saturn and spent 13 years exploring Saturn's and its moons. Or the European probe, which took close-up pictures and even landed a little robot on a comet. Or the American New Horizons probe, which transmitted back to Earth amazingly detailed pictures from Pluto, more than 12,000 times further away than the moon. Think back to the computers and phones of the 1990s when these three probes I've mentioned were designed. Realize how much better we can do today. The next step will be the permit in space of robotic fabricators which can build large structures, for instance, giant telescopes or solar energy collectors which can be assembled under zero gravity. But what about human spacecraft? Here, I think, the practical case gets ever weaker with each advance in robots and miniaturization. So we did have a resurgence. Back at the Apollo program, which I mentioned already, Neil Armstrong landing in 1969. And I cherish this picture signed for me a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts. And it's nearly 50 years since Harrison Schmidt and Ed Chernan the last two people to go on the moon uh, returned to Earth. Hundreds more have ventured into space since that time, but uh, somewhat anticlimactically, they've done no more than circle the Earth in low orbit, many in the International Space Station. And indeed, this is now so routine that they only make news when something goes wrong. When the loo fails, for instance, or when they perform stunts like the Canadian Chris Hatfield playing his guitar and singing David Bowie's song. So will there be any inspirational Apollo type space projects in future? This is the robotic vehicle Perseverance, which landed on the moon earlier this year. And uh, this is currently over the moon, and it can uh, map out its path and avoid obstacles. Um, but it may, of course, miss startling discoveries that no human geologist could overlook. But machine learning is advancing fast, as is sensor technology. And in 10 years' time, the gap between the human and the robotic geologist may be small. 
In contrast, the cost gap between human robotic missions beyond low Earth orbit remains huge. And NASA's manned program, ever since Apollo, has been impeded by public and political pressure into being very risk averse. For instance, the space shuttle failed twice in 135 launches. Astronauts or test pilots would probably accept at least a 2% level of risk willingly. But the shuttle had unwisely been promoted as being safe for civilians. And you may remember the trauma that was caused by those two uh, uh, crashes of the shuttle. But because of this safety culture, NASA will confront political obstacles in achieving any grand goal within a feasible budget. So were I an American, I would strongly support NASA's robotic program, but I'd argue that all human missions should be private enterprise ventures. Elon Musk's SpaceX, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin, they could operate a cut price program far riskier than Western nations could impose on publicly supported civilians. And there'd still be many volunteers, some perhaps accepting a one-way ticket, all driven by the same motives as early explorers, mountaineers, and the like. I think the phrase space tourism should be avoided. Because that lulls people into thinking that these ventures are routine and low risk. If that's the perception, then the inevitable accidents will be as traumatic as those of the space shuttle were. These exploits must be sold as dangerous sports or intrepid exploration, like runoff vines dragging a sledge across the Antarctic or people going hang gliding. But I think that even if it's left to the private sector, by 2100, some courageous thrill seekers may have established bases independent from the Earth. And there may be some Martial, Martians by then. And Musk himself says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. But he's now 50 years old, so 40 years from now, he might make that trip. But don't ever expect mass emigration from the Earth. Nowhere in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. But here I disagree with Musk and with my late colleague Stephen Hawking. It's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from the Earth's problems. Even with the climate change on Earth is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. There's no planet B for ordinary risk averse people. Nonetheless, we should cheer on these brave space adventurers because they have a pivotal role in spearheading a post-human future in the 22nd century and beyond. And this is why they'll be ill-adapted to their new habitat. So they have a more compelling incentive than those of us on Earth to redesign themselves. They'll harness the super powerful genetic and cyborg technologies that will be developed in coming decades. These techniques will, one hopes, be constrained here on Earth on prudential and ethical grounds. But these settlers on Mars will be beyond the clutches of the regulator. And we should surely wish them good luck in modifying their progeny to adapt to this very different and hostile environment. So it's these spacefaring pioneers, not those of us comfortably adapted to life on Earth, who will spearhead the post-human era which Kurzweil envisages. I'm often asked, do astronomers bring a special perspective to global issues? Let me explain why I think they do. We're familiar with this time chart, depicting that we and our biosphere are the outcome of four billion years of Darwinian evolution. It's familiar to most of us, although I saw in a recent poll that only 52% of Americans believe this. But most of those who believe this, in this country and elsewhere, 
somehow think that we humans are the culmination of evolution, the top of the tree. But I don't think any astronomer could believe this. And the reason for that is that we know that the sun is less than halfway through its life. And the cosmos may have an infinite time ahead of it. To quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. So we may be near the beginning in the end, the emergence of ever great complexity in the cosmos. So here's a time chart and we can see where we are today and we can see uh, that the sun has got about six billion years ahead of it and the universe far, far more than that. Human brains have changed little since our ancestors roamed the African savannah. Human nature hasn't changed much. And it's surely remarkable that those brains have allowed us to make sense of so much of physics, remote from everyday experience. The tiny world of the quantum and the cosmos, all far removed from the common sense everyday world in which we and our ancestors evolved. But nonetheless, I think it's important for all of us, especially scientists, to realize that some key features of reality may be, on, be beyond the conceptual grasp of humans. There may be phenomena crucial to our long-term destiny, which we're not aware of. Anyone a monkey comprehends the nature of stars and galaxies. I think it's likely that machines will eventually gain dominance in terms of intelligence in the post-human era. This is because there are chemical and metabolic limits to the size and processing power of wet organic brains. Maybe we're close to that already. So by any definition of thinking, the amount of intensity that's done by organic human type brains may be utterly swamped in the very far future by the cerebrations of AI. Moreover, the Earth's atmosphere, or even Mars's atmosphere, is far from optimal for AI. Interplanetary and interstellar space will be the preferred arena where robotic fabrications will have the grander scope for construction and where non-biological brains may develop insights, insights far beyond our imaginings. Human beings shouldn't feel too humbled by, by this scenario, because even though we are surely not the terminal branch of an evolutionary tree, or even the halfway stage, we could be a special cosmic significance for jump-starting the transition to silicon-based and potentially immortal entities, spreading the influence far beyond the Earth and far transcending our limitations. So this is a, a key question. Will these future probes be human-like or will they be robotic? But it also raises the question, which is the one that astronomers are most often asked. Is there life out there already? Or is the galaxy waiting for our, our progeny, who, as I've indicated, may populate it in the very far future? That's really a topic for a different lecture or the question period. But let me make a few remarks about whether there's life out there in space. Of course, in Bath, we think of Herschel. Herschel thought the planets were inhabited, he even thought the sun was inhabited. In the 19th century, it was widely thought that the planets were inhabited. Indeed, there were many theological reasons. They say, why would God waste all that space if there weren't creatures on those other worlds? But of course, we've learned uh, since space probes have been to the other planets that they may harbor some very primitive life with no advanced life, certainly. But something very important has happened in astronomy the last 20 years. Uh, we've realized that most of the stars in the sky are not just points of light, they are all orbited by retinues of planets, just as the sun is orbited by the Earth and the other familiar planets. So we've now learned that there are literally billions of planets in our Milky Way galaxy. Many of them like the Earth, in the sense of being the size of the Earth and at a distance from a stable star, such as water can exist. So 
there are huge numbers of potential sites alive. And we can't yet uh, observe these yet, but within the next 10 years, we have telescopes powerful enough to observe uh, the planets like the Earth around some of the nearest stars to see any evidence of vegetation or anything else. But looking for advanced life in terms of life is, of course, a bigger gamble. We don't know. We don't know the likelihood that uh, life exists on any of these other planets because habitable doesn't mean inhabited. It could be that the origin of life involves a rare fluke. And even if simple life's common, intelligent life may be, may be rare. Of course, there are some people who think they know the answer already. I mean, I get letters from people who think that... Uh, um, They've been abducted by aliens, um, or they've uh, um, they've met them, etc. Uh, I tend to tell these people that uh, if the aliens had visited, um, they wouldn't uh, just meet one or two well-known cranks, take a corn circle, and go away again. It seems unlikely. So, although aliens may exist in principle, I don't think we know that they're there yet. And I tell these people who think they've seen them that they should write to each other not right back to me. But more seriously, even in the context of a concertina timeline, extending billions of years into the future as well as into the past, um, it is true that our century is special um, because it's the first, as I said in my book, when one species, ours, has a planet future in its hands. Our creative intelligence could jumpstart the transition from an Earth-based to a space-faring species and even from biological to artificial intelligence. This could inaugurate billions of years of post-human evolution even more marvelous than what's led to us. On the other hand, humans could, this century, trigger bio, cyber, or environmental catastrophes which would foreclose all these potentialities. So the stakes are very high century. That's the main theme of my book. But what should be the message to the younger generation who will live in the 22nd century? It surely that there's no scientific impediment to achieving a sustainable world where all enjoy a lifestyle better than those in the West do today. We live under the shadow of new hazards that need to be minimized by a culture of responsible innovation especially in fields like biotech, advanced AI, etc., and by reprioritizing the thrust of the world's technological effort. So we can be technological optimists, but the intractable politics of sociology engenders pessimism. The scenarios I've described, environmental degradation, unchecked climate change, and unintended consequences of advanced technology could trigger serious, even catastrophic setbacks to our society. And our world is so interconnected that the collapse, societal or ecological, could be a truly global setback. Given the stakes, such threats shouldn't be ignored. We should be mindful of Nate Silver's maxim, the unfamiliar is not the same as the improbable. And scientists have an obligation to promote beneficial applications of their work, but also to warn against the downsides. And universities should offer their staff's expertise and their convening power to assess which scary scenarios, echo threats or risk for misapplied technology can be dismissed as science fiction, but how best to avoid the serious ones. And as was mentioned in the the introduction, we in Cambridge set up a center to address just these issues and use our convening power to deploy as much equity as possible on this. And most of these challenges are global. They can't be done by one nation separately. Coping with COVID-19 plainly is. And the threats of potential shortages of food, water and natural resources, and of transitioning to low carbon energy can't be solved by each nation alone nor can the regulation of potentially threatening innovations, especially those spearheaded by globe-spanning commercial conglomerates. Indeed, a key issue, I think, is whether 
in a new world order, nations need to give up more sovereignty to new organizations along the lines of the World Health Organization, the International Atomic Energy Agency, etc. And I'm going to end with a flashback, right back to the Middle Ages. For medieval people, the entire cosmology from creation to apocalypse spanned only a few thousand years. Large parts of the earth were still terra incognita. But they built huge cathedrals, constructed with primitive technology by masons who knew they wouldn't live to see them finished. Glorious buildings, which still inspire us centuries later. And this is Ely Cathedral, just about 12 miles from where I live in Cambridge. Our horizons in space and time are now vastly extended. We don't plan centuries ahead. And this seems a paradox, but there is actually a reason. Medieval lives played out against the backdrop, which changed little from one generation to the next. The Masons were confident that they'd have grandchildren who would appreciate the finished cathedral. But for us, unlike for them, the next century could be drastically different from the present. We can't foresee it, so it's harder to plan for it. And there's now a huge disjunction between the ever-shortening timescale of social and technical change and the billion-year time spans of biology, geology, and cosmology. So spaceship Earth is hurtling through the void. Its passengers are anxious and fractious. Their life support system is vulnerable to disruptions and to breakdowns. But there's too little planning, too little horizon scan. So this pale blue dot in the cosmos is a special place. It may be a unique place. We're its stewards at a specially crucial era. And that's an important message for us all. We need to think globally. We need to think rationally. We need to think long term. We need to be good ancestors, empowered by 21st century technology, guided by what I might call cathedral thinking, and by values that science alone can't provide. So let me finish with that thought. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Lord Rees. Um, we're now going to um, to take some questions. I hope that you're uh, you're ready for this, Martin. Did I unshare my screen? Uh, it it looks great. Uh, you've you've done that. That's that's excellent. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I've got quite a, a number of of questions before me here, and uh, I'll I'll endeavour to get through them all, and I'll ask them pretty much in the order in which they came in. So. Um, Philippa Sondheimer asks uh, a question about the, uh, the the discounting rate on future uh, negative feedbacks that you mentioned quite early on in your talk. And she says, um, what discount rate do you think should be used? Uh, I mean, is, is that something that we can actually compute? Well, uh... It's an important number, of course, and uh, uh, let me mention that the, the, the Treasury um, has something called the Green Book, which gives discount rates which have to be used in assessing the value of capital developments, like building a, um, a power station or something like that. And uh, the recipe there is they discount the future at 3.5% per year for the first 25 years, and that levels off. But the result of that is that um, by 2050, you've discounted everything by a factor of two. And uh, that is, most people think, too much uh, for um, uh, issues where we want to care about the life chances of a baby born today. Um, and uh, uh, we don't know. But I think it's got to be non-zero, because then you get a paradox that we should uh, um, give up everything for future generations. And of course, there is a big uncertainty because uh, uh, we don't know um, what uh, value future generation will place on the particular um, bit of expenditure we make now. Um, so, a, a simple answer is that uh, um, it's a difficult assessment to make 
uh, difficulty as how much sacrifice we should make for future generations, but the treasury rate of 3.5% for 25 years is certainly too much uh, for the um, uh, issues where we ought to take the life chances of babies into account. And incidentally, uh, Born Lomberg does take such a discount rate, and that's why uh, he comes to different conclusions from most other economists. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Duncan says um, that uh, population uh, increases at a greater rate under conditions of poverty, so surely the aim should be to reduce poverty before interfering in human freedom by imposing population control. What, what do you think of that? Um, well, I, I didn't mention population control. I, don't, and, uh, I wouldn't support it, but uh, um, he, he's, he's quite right in that uh, uh, um, educating women and getting later married and all that uh, has um, made the uh, birth rate in 60 countries, I think, fall well below the replacement rate. Some countries, like Singapore, um, they have to give people classes in dating. If they're, they're not sort of a, uh, good, take even the first steps towards having children. Uh, so that's, that's a, a, a ser serious um, question. Um, and I, and I, I quite agree that the, the population may level off um, at about 9 billion um, if uh, the birth rate falls to the replacement level even in parts of India and uh, rural Africa where it's still high. Um, but um, we can't be sure of that because it could be that even when people could control their own fertility and the number of children they have, um, people tend to want the same number of children as their social group. And uh, it may well be that in some parts of the world um, it will be the done thing to have a family of three or four and, uh, um, and they, they will choose that. Um, we don't know. But uh, I certainly aren't um, suggesting anything to children. And I think one of the reasons why population is not discussed, and clearly it's a very important parameter in determining food needs and uh, pressure on the environment and biodiversity, is because um, such discussions are associated with eugenics in the 1930s, uh, with the Chinese one child policy and of Mrs. Gandhi, and uh, we don't want to uh, emulate those. And so that's, I think, had the effect of, um, while suppressing uh, what should be an important issue, which is to discuss um, the uh, um, interaction between population levels and uh, biodiversity and all that. Yes, yes, it, in, indeed. It, it's surprising uh, how great is the effect of uh, uh, um, public opinion and how little effective is government top-down control on such matters. Um, Andreas Fasmut uh, asks, uh, to what extent do you think uh, our attitude to the planet, to technology and each other influence our shared future? Um, I, I guess that uh, Greta Thunberg uh, comes into view here. Yes. Um... Well, I mean, I, I think obviously um, uh, people who care about the planet and think that uh, um, this beautiful world has value over and above uh, the use it is to human beings, uh, they will care about ensuring that we preserve the world, biodiversity, um, and the planet in its natural state. And they've been more concerned, therefore, to, to reduce the impact of humans collectively on, on the planet. Um, and also uh, they'll be able to um, uh, perhaps uh, uh, avoid so much CO2 emissions. But I think there is a trade-off, really, because there's some people who are um, against using uh, advanced technology, whereas others think that in order to um, uh, preserve uh, planet's natural resources and biodiversity with the present population, or with 9 billion by mid-century, does need high tech, that it will need GM crops, um, intensive agriculture, um, etc., um, uh, rather than the organic uh, farming, uh, which actually would involve encroaching far more on natural forests, etc. So I think uh, um, among those who do care 
about the long-term future, um, there is um, a division between those who um, think it can be done by uh, going back into the past using different, different methods, and those who think that it can only be done, um, given the much larger population now, uh, by using uh, technology in order to um, uh, get fossil fuel free uh, energy generation and uh, by growing food in intensive ways. Mm. Th that's a very interesting answer and I imagine that uh, a lot of people will wish to discuss that among themselves afterwards. Uh, Richard Carter asks uh, about uh, the um, about the dangers associated with nuclear power. And he says there's nothing clean or green about nuclear power. And uh, it's a very long question, but I think I could sum it up by saying that he thinks it's expensive and dangerous. And I wondered what you had to say about that. Um, well, there are two things. First, um, uh, one of the problems of, of going to, uh, to net zero and not using fossil fuels is that... Uh, we need to have some steady source of power for base load, because uh, uh, there are long spells when there's no wind or there's no sun, etc. Now you can um, uh, get around that by having a intercontinental uh, smart grid, so you can transport energy from where there is wind and sun to where there isn't, to some extent. But still, you probably need to have a store of energy uh, that's available at any time, and this could be massive batteries. Um, uh, or it could be um, uh, something like um, like nuclear. Um, massive batteries would be possible, but it's rather expensive to store a month's worth of energy to see you through the worst of the winter in, in batteries. Um, and bear in mind, incidentally, we guys need twice as much energy, energy from electricity now if we don't use gas in our home. Um, but um, I, I think um, the, what I say about nuclear is uh, the opinion is very divided. And um, I think most of the designs being used now date from the 1960s. And some believe that we have safer ones now, in particular, small modular reactors, uh, which would be um, built in a standard way. So you get more experience of doing and making them safe, and then they can be uh, uh, moved from a factory to a location and so there's a feeling that they may be safer although even that is controversial um, and so the question is of whether nuclear will be safe and whether it will be um, cheap are, are still uncertain and of course fusion in the long run is something we've talked about but there again uh, there are less concerns about safety but there are uh, more concerns about whether it'll ever be economical but I think it's important to actually um, explore um, all the designs because, as I say, since so few nuclear power stations have been built in the last 20 years, there's been very little innovation in the design. And I think it's worth exploring whether there are new designs and um, uh, the, the thorium, which has less long-lived radioactivity and lots of other things. So um, I think uh, it's a serious concern how we get the uh, base load energy uh, if we don't have fossil fuels, um, and uh, if we don't have nuclear, then it's going to be tough. Mm. But perhaps I could uh, uh, interpose my own question here. Um, do you, uh, as a, a, a distinguished theoretical physicist, see any any reason why uh, nuclear fusion should not be uh, a practical method of power generation? Or is it is it just an engineering matter, or are there, or is it worse than that? Well, you say just engineering. It is. I mean, obviously, the the, uh, the physical principles are clear cut. I yes. Mean, if you have to confine this plasma to 100 million degrees for long enough to get that more energy created, and so um, and, and so the question is, can that can that be done? It's proved very difficult. Um, uh, they're trying a lot of options, and let's hope it can. But it is an engineering one. But uh, I think uh, um, uh, I, I tell my colleagues that engineering is far harder than science. Um, and uh, um, I, I remind them of the rather nice cartoon, uh, which engineers saw like, 
which shows two beavers looking up, up at a big hydroelectric dam. And one beaver says to the other, I didn't actually build it, which is based on my idea. <laughs> and that reflects the balance of sort of brain power that goes into having this an idea and make it work. And I think uh, um, in, in the case of nuclear uh, fusion and fission, uh, then it's the age of engineering, which is a really big challenge. Right. Uh, I share your admiration for engineers. Uh, now, but Bob Fosbury, uh, who is uh, one of our um, very Hi. own astronomers here. Hi. Hi, Bob. Uh, so Bob says, since your last book on this topic in 2003, which novel and or rapid development has most surprised you? Um. Well, I think the rapid uh, um, worldwide spread of, uh, of smartphones and the internet and uh, uh, the way this has changed social habits of social media, because I think in 2003, um, you know, these weren't pervasive at all. Um, but what's remarkable is not only do we have them, but uh, um, in case of Africa, they don't have toilets, they will have smartphones. Um, and uh, um, this, of course, uh, uh, makes them uh, um, justly um, embittered about their fate compared to our fate, but it really changes the world and um, uh, has so many effects on politics and probably uh, enhancing extremism and all that and social media. So, so I, I think it's amazing technology, um, but I think the, uh, uh, the smartphone uh, would have seemed magic as late as 2003. And I think I talked about it generally, having access to all the world's information that the, uh, something might happen. But uh, I, don't, I don't think many people um, perceived how rapidly, um, how impactful um, the spread of uh, uh, smartphones and that technology will be worldwide. Right. Lewis Hyden says, do you think it's responsible to invest so much money and in research into Mars colonization while we're in such a delicate ecological situation here on Earth? Well, no, and that's why I've made clear I don't think any public money at all should be spent on it. Um, and uh, uh, if I was an American, I wouldn't support human space flights, and I don't think European Space Agency should do it. Um, so uh, I think it should be um, done only um, by uh, uh, private people, private private sponsors. That will keep the scale small. So uh, I don't think we should spend huge amounts of money on it. Mm. Uh, Ellie Stone says, if we were able to leave a legacy to the universe, uh, wh what would it be? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, if, let's, let's suppose that uh, uh, we get to this critical century um, and, uh, um, and, and, and perhaps deal with those problems um, and perhaps uh, 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 lead to post-human entities, uh, then I think the post-human entities may at some stage be electronic because there are limits to um, how much you can uh, develop a flesh and blood brain um, which can be surmounted by something electronic. And so um, if we think of what's going to happen in the next four billion years, remember it's nearly four billion from Protozoa to us, but we can expect far bigger changes in the next four billion years because, as I said, the changes will happen not on the Sturdoinian time scale, but on the shorter time scale of technological progress. Um, so um, I, I would guess that if uh, we can get through the present centuries, uh, then uh, there will, within a few thousand years, um, be um, intelligent um, robots. Um, and uh, they will probably not want to be on the planet at all. They prefer zero G. Um, they can assemble things under zero G. And if they're near immortal, then they're not going to be daunted by a long voyage. So I think uh, our legacy may be entities like that. And of course, going back to uh, um, life in space and SETI, um, this has the consequence, which I think is important, that uh, um, if there was another planet which sort of had a head start over ours and evolved uh, intelligent life, uh, then uh, um, we'd be unlikely to catch it in the interval when it's a flesh and blood civilization, far more likely in the far longer subsequent period uh, when uh, we would still detect its uh, 
artifacts. And so I think if we detect something artificial um, with our radio telescopes, then it'll be um, uh, some uh, um, uh, robot, some electronic entity, maybe malfunctioning, or maybe producing some messages that we can't understand. Helen Haste says, what do you think is the most important knowledge and values that we should uh, encourage in children to help equip them for the future that you envisage? Well, hello, Helen, another old friend. There. Um, uh, well, I mean, uh, I think uh, to care about the natural world is important. And uh, um, I think one of the, uh, the sad things, really, is that uh, uh, many Many kids grow up um, not seeing a dark sky and not seeing a bird's nest, maybe not even seeing a cow. And, and I think it's very important that people should be in, in touch uh, with the natural world um, and also um, to um, ensure that they do care about the long term. Um, uh, we could call them um, cathedral thinking and uh, being good ancestors for the next generation. Um, and. Uh, I think there's there's some hopes of, of doing that and to make make them care, and of course, um, uh, if um, the next generation does care about those things, um, then uh, uh, that will make the politicians care. Because the politicians will respond to what uh, the public priorities are. So uh, I would say an education which uh, makes people aware of our, our role in nature and also, I think, of the long term future. Uh, which is hard to predict. Sam Puri says um, the money for space exploration or Mars exploration isn't coming from the Earth's ecological budget. Um, can we cut defence spending to improve ecological conditions and eradicate poverty? So, so what do you think about defence spending, Martin? Uh, well, I think there are, uh, there are huge amounts of expenditure um, which could be redeployed, obviously, to the uh, to deal with poverty, etc., and defence expenditure, especially, for instance, the um, uh, American plan to spend nearly a trillion dollars upgrading their nuclear arsenal. That, that seems to be the, the, the most absurd of all these major expenditures. Um, but I think um, beyond that, um, I, I would uh, um, I, I believe we should do all we can to reduce. Um, excessive inequalities both within countries and between countries of the uh, global north and the global south. Um, and, uh, it, it's a, a the indictment that the, um, uh, um, the richest um, thousand people in the world um, have enough wealth to double the income of the bottom billion. So um, massive taxation of big companies and the wealthy to generate a more equal society. Uh, and that uh, should be used in this country to provide uh, um, better pay and status for uh, carers for young and old, etc. They are going to be um, displaced by, uh, uh, by, by by robots and who now work in call centres and uh, um, in retail. Uh, they, they would have a more fulfilling life if they could be supported as uh, uh, carers for young, young or old teachers' assistants, custodians of public parks and things like that. So uh, there's plenty of work for everyone to do, um, but it requires a re massive redistribution. Don Cameron says, um, it's clear that population growth and poverty are correlated, but in which direction does the causation work? A previous questioner assumed the answer, but I'm not so sure, says Don. Um, this is a big question for all scientists, isn't it? Which direction is the causation working in? Yes, yes. Um, uh, well, I mean, I think I think if, if we consider, we have a if you have a starting point uh, where, where where people are very poor, um, then uh, if infant mortality is high, then understandably um, uh, they uh, have a lot of children. So that's that's the reason why traditionally. In the poor countries, there has been rather family size, um, and uh, we, we really want um, to improve their lives. And, and I think it is clear, there's pretty there's evidence that in the richer countries, the um, birth rate does fall. Um, 
but 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 I think um, if you could by magic reduce the birth rate, then uh, that that would probably um, increase welfare. But I, I think we 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 can't we can't do that forcibly. So I think what we've got to do is to um, uh, ensure that as we get uh, wealthier, uh, then the birth rate falls. And people don't feel they've got to have a lot of children because some will die, etc. Um, okay, Deep Ali Gaskell says uh, energy is the basis of all existence. Uh, as we understand in my culture, which is uh, from India, uh, life is a form of energy. Do you think that there may well be a new form of this energy combination in the future, a new form of life. So I suppose what she's saying is, um, uh, could could you imagine a form of life that, that was energy-based? Um, well, of course, uh, our life is energy-based, as, as she implies. The, uh, the food we eat, you, you could do a flow diagram of how the energy goes. Um, from the from the sun uh, into our into the, making our bodies and all that, so uh, that is happening. Um, but I think um, it is an interesting question: um, Could there be um, uh, other kinds of photosynthesis, or could there be life with a different uh, basis? And of course, this has become uh, uh, a more interesting question in the context of exobiology, where we now uh, know that there are lots of places in the galaxy where uh, life could evolve. And uh, we, we want to know um, if, if life does evolve, will it all have the same basis as the life on Earth, DNA and RNA and all that, um, or could it be quite different? Um, could there even be, um, be life that doesn't uh, uh, need to be water-based? I mean, uh, could there even be some life on um, uh, Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, where there are lots of lakes uh, and rivers of methane? And we, don't, we don't know. Uh, so uh, I think there are, there are lots of other ways which we can imagine um, solar energy, um, which is the basis of most of the energy that we, we use, um, uh, uh, being converted by the very long logical links in the chain into something intelligent. Yeah. You know, uh, we know how it's happened. It's very, very complicated, but there may be other ways. Yeah, the, 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 there's uh, uh, hours worth of uh, discussion to be had there, I think. Uh, Richard Carter, I'm not sure if he's serious here, says perhaps the other planets are inhabited by spirits. Rupert Sheldrake has proposed that the sun can think. Um, actually, I, I think that's not such a silly question as all that, is it? So some, sometimes people compare fire to life and i think that uh, i would say that the, the difference there is that it has rather a low information content anyway uh, we're kind of running out of time here um uh so i'm going to choose just just one more question and then we're going to shut down i think um right um anthony uh says um I think this is actually from the, um, the chair of the Herschel Society. He says, hello, do you think that humans or life on other planets, if, they, if it exists, will ever have the technology to travel the vast distance between each other? I think uh, post-humans might. Uh, two, two things, but you've either got to have uh, nuclear power or matter antipatter annihilation, or you've got to do a very long time. I mean, uh, uh, present technology uh, would allow you to get to another star if you're prepared to take a million years about it. About it. Um, and of course, uh, uh, we, we won't do that. But if you, if you are near a mortal, if you're electronic, um, then even if you can't go any faster than present technology allows, um, then um, you might hibernate for a million years and be quite happy to do that, and you would get across the galaxy. Uh, so uh, I think... Um, our limitations are um, not only our technology, but uh, um, if we are tied to a human lifespan. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to apologise to those people who uh, submitted questions, but uh, 
uh, we didn't have time to ask them on on your behalf. Um, I guess that uh, the best thing I can recommend is that you go off and buy a copy of Lord Rees's new book, um, which I'm sure you'll find uh, on the shelves at Waterstones or Mr. B's or uh, on the internet. Um, I'm going to hand over now uh, to Dr. Yukteswar Kumar, who's the Deputy Mayor of Bath, uh, and uh, he's going to have something to say. Uh, many thanks. I'm sure all of you would agree that Lord Rees' lecture was indeed fabulous, scintillating, charming, and perhaps a captivating Christmas treat, a scholarship of the most highest order, delivered for about 62 minutes without an iota of scintilla, scintilla of agitation, and with a lively question and answer session afterwards. Victor, who believed with the same passion in the BRLSI's lecture programs, and perhaps, uh, and did help in running it as a convener, a uh, philosophy convener, convener, would without doubt have been delighted, and wherever he is, would have released the talk himself. Lord's speech reminded me of my own speech, which I delivered eight years ago at the Chinese Academy of Social Science in Beijing, China, India, Tango, who wins in 2050. I was pleasantly surprised to hear Mahatma Gandhi's Maxim's quotation and to see that on one of the slides, the captions were written in Chinese too, which I could read, Tiao Chan, Chuan Chu Ren Kou De Yu Tse, which was about nine billion people uh, in 2043 projected. Lord Wright rightly pointed out that we must avoid anti-utopian or dystopian risks. As we say, think globally and act locally. Last but not the least, on behalf of the mayority and as the deputy mayor of the city, I thank to the Lord the organizers, Professor Ian, a doyen himself in the field of English literature, and wishing everybody a very, very Merry Christmas and a very happy New Year in advance. Thank you. <laughs>